begin by inviting you just to reflect on how you celebrated the 20th of March this year. I'm sure you recall the 20th of March it was a day for celebration. How did you spend it? Blank looks around the world. The 20th of March was World Happiness Day. How did that pass you by? I thought it would have been a day on which you would have gone about telling everyone to cheer up. Uh, perhaps it was a day in which we were expected to pretend just for one day that there were no shadows falling across our lives, no bereavement, no life-threatening illnesses, no friends who disappoint us or relationships that unravel. Uh, perhaps it was a day on which we were expected to go about chanting the mantra of positive psychology, the glass is half full. Well, we know the old story, don't we? The, the optimist, the pessimist says the glass is half empty. I'm personally drawn to the engineer who looked at the glass and said that glass is exactly twice as big as it needs to be. <laughs> That's a realistic you know, position. Achieve the emotion. 
emotional state that you want to, especially uh, a state of euphoria or something you might call happiness, if you can't achieve it by any of those means, then there's an entire pharmacological industry at your disposal. Uh, and it seems to me no accident at all, no coincidence. And at the very time when we've become increasingly obsessed with the right to happiness, we've seen the burgeoning of the recreational drug market. The other problem uh, with this obsession on positive emotions, so-called, uh, is that we're in danger of overlooking one of the loveliest things about being human, which is that we have at our disposal a full spectrum of emotions, ranging through happiness, joy, bliss, euphoria, triumph, to sadness, disappointment, loss, failure, all of those ways we can feel, all of those experiences that we can have, that taken together teach us what it means to be human. Remove any of them, or relentlessly pursue any one of them, and you're likely to miss all of the riches of the contrast. How, in fact, would you ever make sense of being happy if you hadn't experienced sadness? How do you know what succeeding is if you haven't tasted the bitterness of failure? Uh, of course, we'd all like to feel happy. Of course, euphoria is a lovely way to feel. But our folklore has it right. Our folklore says we grow through pain. We know that. You've probably had that said to you. You've possibly said it to other people. And yet the pain comes, and suddenly, in the present climate, we're anxious to get rid of it. Let's have another drink. Let's have a pill. Let's get rid of the pain as quickly as possible before it's had time uh, to teach us anything or to allow us to grow. Our folklore says adversity is the great teacher, and is not that true? Don't we know? And it's often the experiences we would never wish on ourselves or on anyone else. Uh, the experiences that take us into dark places that really do have a great deal to teach us about what it means to be human and why we are the kind of people we are. I'm sure you recall uh, the experience of James Magnuson, the Olympic swimmer, who failed so spectacularly in the men's relay at the London Olympics. Uh, you might also recall the day after Magnus had been quoted as having said that he learned more about himself in those 24 hours than he had in the previous 24 years. And I guess most of us can relate to that. Which does not, of course, mean that we wish failure on ourselves or on our children so that we can learn the lessons of failure. No one seeks sadness, except particular kinds of neurotic who like trouble. But most of us don't. Most of us don't seek these things. But how absurd, how unrealistic it would be to pretend that they're not going to come to us or to our children and our grandchildren. Which is why I get very perplexed when I hear parents, especially the parents of young children, saying, something that you very often hear and may have said to yourself, I just want my kids to be happy. As though nothing else matters, just as long as my kids are happy. Now you understand why parents say that. Of course parents are not going to go about saying, I just want my kids to be miserable. <laughs> uh, of course we'd like our kids uh, to be cheerful, to have an optimistic, buoyant disposition. But just that, I just want my kids to be happy. When parents say that, I wonder what they mean by happiness. I wonder whether they're drawing on the wisdom of the ancient Greeks. I suspect they're not, by the way. Uh, but I wonder if their view is the view of Aristotle, who used a word, a Greek word, eudaimonia, which has been generally translated as happiness. But what Aristotle meant when he said eudaimonia was, the experience of living in accordance uh, with your sense of purpose, living a virtuous life, being fully engaged with the life of the community, experiencing the richness of human love and friendship, the wonderful phrase, the 
that Aristotle still translates as the richness of human love and friendship. Well, anyone who's experienced the richness of human love and friendship knows that's not all the sweetness of love. <laughs> uh, human love and friendship brings us enormous joy uh, and brings us pain. Uh, brings us comfort and reassurance and disappointment uh, and failure. So Aristotle, when he spoke about eudaimonia, was speaking about something that I think perhaps would translate better today uh, into a word like wholeness rather than happiness. So if that's what parents mean when they say, I just want my kids to be happy, no, you want them to live virtuously, to be fully engaged with the life of the community, etc. Great. But perhaps what they mostly mean is, I want them to feel good. I want them to be emotionally buoyant. I want them to have a positive frame of mind all the time. And if that's what they mean when they say, I just want my kids to be happy, then I would like to shake them and say, this is an absurd and unhelpful goal to set for your own children. You just want them to be happy. You want to raise emotional cripples, do you? You want to raise kids who have not experienced pain and loss and failure, uh, who don't understand about disappointment uh, and how we deal with it. Uh, you, you don't want kids uh, who've learned to accept that referees are sometimes biased, uh, that teachers are not all as good as each other and one year you'll get a bad one, uh, or that friends can let you down. All of that is what human life is really like. And learning to expect it and deal with it is how we build resilience in our children and our grandchildren. We just want them to be happy. We know what just being happy is like. Probably everyone in the hall has been through periods in life of just being happy. It's called falling in love. And uh, people who are in love in the first flush of romantic love are essentially dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a state to wish of anybody uh, as a permanent condition. Uh, and crashing of things, they make appalling misjudgments about all sorts of things, especially each other. And, um, uh, I, I, I was at a conference uh, not long ago, and the speaker it was a happiness conference. In fact, I'm not sure what I was doing there, but. Uh, speakers, so next time you go to the doctor, give your doctor a piece of chocolate, and this will give the doctor a little sugar hit, there'll be a little emotional lift, and you'll get a better diagnosis. <laughs> could this possibly be right? Uh, and soon after, I read some research published by the University of New South Wales, Professor Joe Forrest has been studying the relationship between mood and decision making. And the conclusion that he had come to was that we make our best decisions when we're feeling slightly blue. Uh, not, the, not depressed, uh, not in a state of anxiety or despair, but just when the needle is a little bit towards the negative end of the emotional spectrum. We do not make good decisions when we're feeling euphoric and contented or in love. Uh, so I decided on balance, probably not a good idea to give a piece of chocolate to my doctor next time. But happiness is a word that persists in our vocabulary as something we should be striving for. It's part of a, one of a cluster of key words at the moment. Are other words like self-esteem, um, excellence. Notice everything is a centre for excellence. I'm not sure whether the HBR is a centre for excellence. <laughs> not that I wish them to be a centre for mediocrity. Um, but we all do our best. School, every car show, every wherever you go, it's all a centre for excellence in some field or another. Um, happiness, self esteem, excellence, even perfection. Uh, these are words that are symptomatic of a, of a disease that has Western society in its grip at the moment, and Australia is no exception. In, in the new book, uh, I describe this disease as the utopia complex. The idea that all of us are entitled to a personal utopia, uh, that we're marching into a fabulous future 
banners triumphantly a flutter. Uh, everything is terrific. Perfect teeth. This is a great time to be an orthodontist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a community obsessed with perfect teeth. Perfect breasts. Great time to be a cosmetic surgeon. Uh, the perfect latte. I bet you know where the perfect latte is uh, in Newcastle. Perfect marriages. And if they're not perfect, well, perfect divorces. Uh, in this perfect world we dream of and feel as if we're entitled to, outcomes are always positive. Now, you may think I'm exaggerating, but if you walk into any bookshop at the moment, or into your library, you'll see that there's a whole section on happiness. And in that section, you'll find books that are selling exactly the kind of proposition I've just been outlining. And I want to read you just one sentence from one of those books, which will give you some idea of what we're up against uh, when we're trying to take a slightly more realistic view of what to expect uh, out of human existence. Uh, this is a sentence which I am extremely proud not to have written. <laughs> but it comes from a book called The Storm Before the Calm. You may, you may have read the book, uh, but this is the sentence. The function of life, you know this is going to be a big call when it begins with the function of life. The function of life is to recreate yourself anew in each golden moment of now. Can I then for now? In the next grandest version of the greatest vision you ever held about who you are. Now, I'm not absolutely sure what that means. <laughs> but when I read it, I thought, give me a break. <laughs> I, I just want to get on with it. You know, I just want to do my best. I wasn't thinking about the next grandest version, etc., etc. Uh, I was just hoping for 